thank you so much to all of you joining us today. We are delighted to let you know that there are over 550 people registered, and I'm sure each one of the people registered are here today. We have a very, very exciting agenda and a great lineup of, of, uh, of luminaries today to talk about different aspects of the of food finance architecture. It's now known very clearly, very articulately, we need a food system that can deliver healthy people, healthy planet and healthy economy. We cannot meet our climate commitments without a major disruption in the way we are producing food and in the way we are eating food. We cannot have a post-COVID green recovery without Food Central, as this is the largest employer. We cannot have 3 billion people either going hungry or not getting enough calories or eating the wrong kind of calories. But to be able to deliver a food system that delivers people, planet, economy in a healthy manner, we absolutely cannot have a food system with, with hidden environmental, economic, and social costs of $12 trillion that is subtracting rather than adding value. And this means financing of such a system is part of the problem and therefore has to be the solution when we are thinking about food system transformation. And in a sense, this is what today's discussion is about. This is a public forum. What you'll be hearing is work in progress. We want your input. We want to know what we got wrong, what we missed out, and what, where we are heading in the right direction. We want to take what we hear today. If not in today's public forum, then please write to us uh, bilaterally uh, to, to what else is needed to create a food finance architecture that creates the incentives, but also the disincentives to move this agenda in the, in, the, in, in the right direction in the coming way. With that, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our first speaker, Martin Frick, Deputy UNSG Special Envoy uh, for the uh, UN Food Systems 2021. Martin, over to you. Dita, thank you so much. And I pick something up that you just said, it's work in progress and indeed, it's not only our summit being work in progress with a milestone coming up in some days on the free summit, <clears throat> but it's also all of the food system transformation will remain work in progress for the next nine years, which is ambitious in itself. But I think, you know, when we set out to this process, we defined a couple of desirable outcomes of the forum. Um, of the summit. And one was, and the first on the list was to change the way um, people think and talk about food, um, food systems. And this profound transformation of the angle that people have on their food, not as a niche product, not as something that is amongst many other things, part of the reality, but really as the centerpiece and to say it in the UN language as the centerpiece between all of the development and all of the environmental agenda, this is currently underway. And you will hear in a moment from David Navarro from the experience from the ground. And there is a real appetite and understanding that we don't need to fiddle at the margins. We have to systemically address um, the challenges that are over us. And if you just look at the news of the last days, um, the new SOFI report came out that tells us about the state of hunger and food insecurity on this planet. And in 2020, 161 million additionally suffered from hunger compared than before. And this spike is not even quite represented there because as I said, it is the numbers for 2020 and we are still in the COVID pandemic and we will remain in the COVID pandemic for quite some time longer. And then at the same time, the impacts of climate change are all about us. And I personally have started to be interested in climate change in 2007. And what we see today are pretty much the worst case scenarios scientists gave us for 2030 to 2040. It is absolutely not normal to have almost 50 degrees centigrade in Canada. 
um, 55 degrees almost in the United States. And while we speak, big parts of Europe are flooded in a way that, you know, as news would express that is not happening in a hundred years, but we do know that unfortunately we will not have to wait another hundred years for the next event of this sort. And it is, you know, when you're daily connected with people all over the planet, it is also what you learn between the lines, people pumping water out of their cellars, they're staying indoors because they can't go out, it's too hot. So very clearly we have to address that. Now, let me speak about money very briefly. Money is always an issue. Of course, everybody, everything always needs money, but this is about the intelligent use of money. It's not about building back better after the COVID crisis. It's building something else that is preventing pandemics, that ensures that people are getting enough and nutritious food so they can strive um, for better lives. It is getting this climate crisis under control while literally the window of doing so is closing. And that will need a lot of money, but not addressing it in a systemic way will cost us more than only money, if I can say so. And no money in the world will be good enough to make good for. So I hope that this discussion we are having helps us A, raising more of the awareness needed that money invested in a clever way in food systems is money well invested and helps us broadening and spreading the word about that and helping us bringing the communities together so we can integrate horizontally across governments, different sectors, but also vertically with regions, cities, all the way down to the producers, to the many small and medium-sized enterprises who are the backbone of our food security and if they are suffering the main reasons for our food insecurity. And with that, Gita, thank you very much and back to you and it's exciting to be here. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you so much for highlighting the crisis, but also uh, talking about how critical finance is to meet the ambition. So thank you for being with us today. With that, let me now turn to our next speaker, Binja Pustar Zarvi, founder and CEO of Slow Forest Coffee, who will talk about how getting finance right is critical to scale sustainable business model like hers. Over to you, Pinja. Great to have you. Hi, thank you, Gita. Hi, so my name is Pinja uh, and I'm the co-founder uh, of Slow Coffee. Uh, and as a thought starter uh, to this session, I would like to share some of our experiences and challenges uh, that we've had uh, with getting access to financing. Uh, and then also how we as a company uh, have overcome them. Okay, thank you. So very briefly about Slow. Uh, so we are a fully vertically integrated coffee company. Uh, so we have our production set up in Laos where we produce our coffee uh, and then we have a sales organization in Denmark. Uh, and as a company, our mission is to convert monoculture coffee farms uh, into sustainable uh, organic uh, agroforestry, while at the same time uh, restructuring socially and environmentally unsustainable value chains that we see uh, in the coffee industry today. And now if I reflect back on our journey uh, as a sustainable food startup, um, we have of course had our fair share of challenges uh, in getting financing. But in particular, uh, this has been an issue uh, at our current stage where we are really trying to sort of take the company to the next level, uh, scale up our sales, uh, scale up our operations, right? Uh, so the first problem that we often encounter uh, when we speak to institutions uh, is that we get the feedback that our uh, risk profile is too high, right? So we are a new company, we are still young, uh, we don't have a full proof of concept, uh, it's a risky geography and so on. Uh, and this is obviously a little bit of a catch 22 uh, because without capital, uh, it's, it's difficult to do a proof of concept. 
uh, in addition uh, for, for institutions uh, where we uh, receive positive feedback, what we also often encounter is that we don't really fit their mandate, right? Uh, so either the ticket size is too small uh, for them to bother uh, going through, uh, or then we are perhaps in the you know, wrong segment uh, or, or wrong geography. Okay, so as, as a company, uh, we really had to face up to the question, you know, how, how are we gonna you know, overcome uh, this next step uh, and, and get uh, to scaling up our model. Next, please. And interestingly, uh, the solution actually did not come uh, from the capital market, uh, but rather it came from our clients. Uh, so what we did is we partnered with Core. Uh, so Core is a large uh, Nordic facility management company. Uh, and what they have done uh, is they have committed to a seven year contract uh, for roasted coffee with us uh, with fixed volumes. Uh, and in the coffee world, you know, this is, this is very long, right? And now if we think of the reasons behind why they are doing this, uh, the good news is that uh, more and more of these pioneering companies like Core uh, are starting to see the value in coffee uh, beyond just uh, the commodity price, right? So they want to drive uh, sustainability to grow their own uh, operations, uh, but also to respond to the changing risk landscape, right? So anticipating uh, policy shifts, uh, mitigating climate change related risks and so on. And now the great thing is that this commitment uh, that we got from CORE uh, enables us uh, to, to trial out our regenerative model. Um, so what we're gonna do now uh, is that against the contract, we're gonna purchase a farm uh, and then gradually over seven years, uh, we're gonna convert it into an organic agroforest. Uh, and we of course also then deliver core uh, roasted coffee uh, from this very same farm. Um, and this cooperation has really solved uh, a lot of the issues uh, that we had uh, in our model. So first of all, uh, we have uh, de-risked uh, the, the, the uh, project profile. So now the coffee has an off-taker uh, at a company where this is already a cost item that is existing. Uh, and this of course, in turn, uh, leads to improved access to capital uh, and enables us to scale up. Okay. Uh, and then finally, I want to share three of our learnings uh, and reflections that we've had over our journey. So one is that, you know, the good news is that the opportunity to form these uh, so-called off-taker partnerships uh, to really drive innovation forward with bigger companies, it, it is, you know, here and now. Uh, so what we see is that it is a lot easier now after COVID than before COVID uh, to have these conversations with companies. So something has definitely shifted. Uh, but then secondly, uh, very important, um, in addition uh, to providing capital uh, to, to sustainable food companies, uh, I think it is an important task uh, for financiers uh, to help these companies form these critical partnerships uh, with these so-called off-takers. So for us, I mean, we were uh, very lucky because we have our uh, Danish sales organization. We have, you know, very active Danish investors, which then made it possible for us to find core uh, and other similar companies. But, you know, if I look out there, uh, there's so many, you know, innovative uh, agroforestry, uh, food innovation companies out there. Uh, and, you know, they could be located out in Laos or in Kenya or, or wherever. And honestly, it is not easy for them to bridge this gap uh, to these customers who could help them. So I think as financiers, besides providing capital, uh, your network can really play a very important role uh, in bridging this gap. Uh, and then finally, uh, I think the uh, markets uh, should update their risk assessment criteria a little bit uh, to take into account uh, the shift in the landscape. Uh, so, uh, you know, the increasing importance of, of uh, policy changes going forward, climate change risks, and, and so forth. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Pinya. You're indeed a thought provoker because you've not, you've really demonstrated an example of how non-traditional models are working and the challenges that that uh, that people like you are facing. And that's exactly what the finance lever is trying to do: identify new solutions and see what can be scaled up. So thank you very much for being a part of this forum today with us. With that, thank let you. me welcome Martin, um, Global Director. Uh, for agriculture and uh, food practice at the World Bank. Martin, over to you. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Gita, and uh, greetings to all from uh, from Washington, uh, DC. Um, I'm very pleased to kind of provide an update of what the finance lever is uh, is up to. And as Gita was saying, of course, you know, this is very much uh, working progress. And for that reason, uh, this public forum is actually is very timely when it comes to further defining and refining, I mean, the finance actions that we expect, I mean, to come out of the UN Food System Summit in, in September. Uh, next slide, please. So, so let me start by kind of indicating, you know, how the finance lever is part of the Food System Summit architecture. As you can see on the slide, it's one of the uh, levers, one of the four levers that provides a kind of a cross-cutting lens uh, in this case, finance uh, on the five thematic areas, I mean, covered by the respective action tracks that are indicated on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, it means that ideally, I mean, any finance-related actions, you know, uh, that we will come up with are closely linked to the solutions, I mean, that are put forward by the action tracks. And uh, for that reason, I mean, the finance lever team is very much uh, working closely with the action track teams and, and doing so also reflects very much, I mean, that we in the finance lever team, I mean, see finance very much as a means to an end and of course, not an objective in itself. Uh, next slide, please. Now, who, who, who is the finance lever? Who are we? I mean, so um, it is made up of kind of, you know, four entities. I mean, uh, the World Bank Group, uh, the International Food Policy Research Institute, I mean, the Food and Land Use Coalition and the Finance Network, and each of them, I mean, kind of play different roles, I mean, in the finance lever as indicated uh, on the slide. I think most of you know the Food and Land Use Coalition, the World Bank Group and, and IFPRI. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the finance network uh, because that is relatively new. It's, an, it's a coalition of private and public financial institutions that was recently established under the umbrella of the World Business Council of Sustainable Development. Uh, and the objective of this network is to put the financial sector squarely behind the food systems transformation agenda and, and moving this forward. Uh, uh, invitations for membership, I mean, for this finance network uh, will soon be shared. But meanwhile, parties can actually already indicate, I mean, their interest to be part of it at the World Bank Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, so with these four entities making up the finance lever, um, I think we are able to bring, or we think we are able to bring together a nice combination of experience and expertise in finance, in policies, in innovation and communications, along with a very large stakeholder network and substantive uh, convening power. Next, next slide, please. Um, an important starting point for our work in the finance lever has been the notion that the food system currently is not fit for purpose, uh, while at the same time having the potential, of course, I mean, to, to unlock huge opportunities contributing to healthy people, a healthy planet and a healthy economy. Um, the notion, I mean, that the food system is not fit for purpose is reflected by the many dimensions of the hidden cost that it generates and as indicated on the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, and if you add up, I mean, these hidden costs, um, they're actually massive, you know, and they amount to about $12 trillion uh, annually. And um, as a reminder, I mean, the, uh, the market value of the global food system is about $20 trillion per year. At the same time also, the food system can unlock many opportunities. I mean, that could deliver very substantive benefits across many dimensions that go beyond the typical notion of what is meant by agriculture. 
including human health, I mean, critical ecosystem services and climate change, you know, and on the right hand side of the slides, I mean, uh, those different dimensions of those benefits are indicated. Now, in order to tackle, I mean, these multidimensional hidden costs and unlock these multidimensional benefits, I mean, there is need for a broader, more systematic focus on food systems, along with the notion that business as usual is not sufficient, and that there is a need for a fundamental transformation of the food system as we know it. And of course, I mean, this can only happen if finance can be lined up in support of such transformation. Next slide. Now, another important notion in our thinking in the finance lever, and I think Gita also, also said it in her introduction, is that current financial flows, I mean, contribute to the hidden costs of the food system and therefore are part of the problem. And, um, you know, this is reflected by, I mean, the very limited amount of climate finance going into agriculture and food. I mean, a failure to price in the hidden cost of the food system, the existence of massive perverse incentives, I mean, caused by existing public support to agriculture and food. I mean, this is massive. I mean, to the tune of about $700 billion per year. The significant barriers that many food systems act to face in accessing finance. And I think, um, the example, I mean, previous to my intervention actually was, was a nice kind of um, reflection and indication uh, of that. Of course, insufficient incomes, limiting farmers' ability to invest in sustainable practices, and also limited accountability by the private sector. I mean, as a reference, I mean, there was only one food company in the sustainability top 100 based on environment, social and governance practices, ESG practices, as published by the Wall Street Journal in a massive survey that was done and published in October, 2020. Um, uh, the um, uh, share of the food sector in the global economy is about 12%. So rather than one, you would actually expect 12 of those food companies in the top 100. Next slide, please. Now, in light of these challenges, I mean, the finance lever has been very actively engaging with the various partners, including the action tracks, as I already mentioned earlier, the institutions making up the finance network and all the stakeholders, I mean, to come up with financial solutions and initiatives. I mean, we are currently incorporating this in a shared vision for a sustainable and inclusive food finance architecture. And important pillars of this vision are a set of what we think are financial imperatives for food systems transformation that we are putting forward. Next slide. So these financial imperatives are listed on this on these slides. I mean, they relate to integrating climate risk, paying for nature, prioritizing prevention and resilience, repurposing public spending and fiscal incentives, optimizing and scaling public and, 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 uh, and develop, public financing and development flows, improving access to finance, optimizing, optimizing ways of working in financial institutions, strengthening employment and improving incomes, committing to reduce unsustainable investments and improving reporting and transparency. Now, this is a long list, actually, it's a set of 10 financial imperatives. Uh, um, but as you see, I mean, these financial imperatives, I mean, cast a pretty wide net. And we think this is commensurate with the challenge at hand, I mean, the challenge of food systems transformation. Also, as you note, I mean, these imperatives are directly linked to the challenges that the food system is facing that I presented in the previous slides. They also provide actually a call for action for both the public sector and the private sector. And they also reflect a very good uh, mixture of carrots and sticks. So, so we think this is actually coming together as a nice relevant uh, uh, package. Uh, of course, as I said, still work in progress. Next slide. Now also when we look at these financial imperatives for food systems transformation, I mean, the good news is uh, that there is 
political men momentum on many of these and that there are also success stories that could be built upon. And I think this was Martin was, was, was alluding to that when he said, this is work in progress. We're not starting from scratch, you know, when we talk about those financial imperatives. I mean, you can see that there's already a lot of movement on many of those. So we would be really keen to learn about additional success stories and initiatives that could be linked, I mean, to these financial imperatives. And hopefully in today's public forum, we might hear from the audience, I mean, a number of other examples uh, that will be relevant. Uh, so to sum up, I mean, we, we think that these financial imp imperatives provides for a very relevant and balanced package in support of the food system transformation uh, uh, that is needed. And of course, over the next few months up to this food system summit in September, we are as finance lever team, we'll be working on further defining and refining these based on the feedback that we uh, receive. With that, uh, thank you very much. And I hand it back to you, uh, Gita. Thank you very much, Martin, uh, um, for, for taking us through the thinking of the finance lever. Um, Martin's laid out the broad shifts that need to occur. And one of the, the underpinning of the broad shifts is really about innovation, including in the financial sector. So it gives me a lot of pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, Ruben, who is the Commissioner on Sustainable Agriculture Intensification. Uh, Ruben, over to you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Gita. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. I have five minutes and uh, I, I, I just have a, a couple of messages uh, from the, on behalf of the Commission on Sustainable Agricultural Intensification. The, the Commission wants to promote, to advocate for more investment, better investment in innovating in the Global South. The Commission is composed of all Global South members. And, um, and the good news I have is that despite the very low investment in innovation in sustainable ag intensification that I will show soon, uh, is doable. Uh, the gap is not that much, so we can do it. That's kind of my main message. In the next uh, slide, please, uh, I just wanted to show what we are doing. Um, we, we are trying to do four major things uh, to look at the, not only at the global level, but at the regional and national level. We want to uh, understand a bit better what, what, what are the food priorities for investments, uh, the food system priorities and so on at the national level. What I'm going to be showing today is uh, on the second chapter, second issue, which is how much investment is, is needed. So I will be showing uh, uh, our preliminary estimate on the what's the baseline being invested today and what's the funding gap. We also want to, we are working on the instruments. What are the approaches and instruments and the pathways? Uh, it, you know, we all learn by examples. Uh, numbers, there are a lot of numbers floating around. But what, 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 show me a pathway that uh, has happened in Brazil, India, and Kenya. So we have those case studies coming soon. And the most important part, before we finish in about four or five months, uh, the work of the commission, and others hopefully will follow up with what we're doing, is how to measure it. So we are working quite a bit on the principles and metrics. If we could agree, it's a big dream. If we could all agree on this summit, on a few metrics, uh, or that we complementary, we can get together and, and say, okay, we are transforming something in such and such time, I think there will be a lot of progress. Uh, next slide. Um, this is based on a contract that we have with Dalbert Asia. And these are uh, our best preliminary estimates on how much is being invested today. And it's very little. It's only $60 billion per year invested in total agricultural innovation in the global south. That's about 4% of agricultural output in the global south. Uh, and the main funders are governments, 40 billion. Half of that is China, 20 billion is China. And the next one are private companies. Uh, they are investing quite a bit, about $15 billion in agricultural innovation in the Global South, followed by development partners, World Bank, regional development banks, philanthropy, bilateral, and, and, and others. And then about a billion and a half private equity and venture capital. So that's, those are the main funders. And this is about the picture that, that we had, but we never 
thought they were so small, only 60 billion. Now, if, if we apply the definition that we use, and you can check in our website about sustainable agriculture intensification, it's about 7% of that. So it's a very low percentage of the 60 billion. It's about six to 7 billion only. Uh, if we if really are strict and say, well, how much of this is for environmental aims? How much of this is for social aims? If we put the two together, it's still very, very small. So this is the annual um, good baseline that we have so far. And, uh, and we hope to keep refining this and so on. $60 billion is about the size of the economy of the country that I was born, Uruguay. So it's very small. And if you take a percentage of that, the 7% is very small. So the baseline is low. Despite all the talk about innovation, about all the global south, all of this going on since uh, biblical times, the investment is not that much. In the next one is the headlines on the funding gap. Based on that low baseline of investment, how much will we need? And there are many estimates. There are many estimates. This is just another estimate. A good estimate, this is coming from IFPRI. So the business as usual scenario is about uh, today being invested about $10 billion for research and development, uh, mostly public, and about three and a half billion for water use efficiency. So if we want to, if we want to achieve uh, SDG 2 and 13, and most of six, SDG 6 on water, and uh, if, if, if we really want to help that, the, the funding gap, the total funding gap, the big headline is about $15 billion. So it's not that much uh, compared to other numbers that are floating around. We need to refine these estimates. We are working on that. But this, this is annual additional $15 billion to 2030. And that's composed for about $4 billion to technical research and development. This including national systems, regional, and the CGR, and others at the international level. Plus climate smart options of about six and a half billion to scale up all of these best practices that we already have of climate smart options. And about four to five billion dollars on water use efficiency. Uh, that will lower about 10% the use of water in the global south uh, up to 2030. So as you can see, the, the gap is not that much. $15 billion today. Uh, is not that much, uh, additional to the business as usual scenario that we have. This, this will bring uh, the zero hunger target uh, to, be, to be achievable. Uh, this will bring the Paris uh, commitments uh, very close to be, to be achieved. And this, this will help a lot on the SDG 6 on water, uh, on water use efficiency and so on. So, so, it will also boost GDP in the global south for close to two trillion dollars, according to this if we estimate. It will decrease food prices by about 16 percent, which is great. Food prices are going up today, and uh, and and that means at about two percent uh, uh, per capita income in the global south uh, in increase. So this is the best uh, headline that I had to show. Uh, on the what, what will be based on a low baseline, how much will be the funding now? In the next one, uh, we are working quite a bit on what, what are the new innovative financing instruments. Uh, we have a definition and a list of those in the, in the website. So the message that I want to show here is that only three to four billion dollars of all of that innovative financing that we discuss and we see papers and there's a lot of action going around, only three to four billion dollars are going through innovative, innovative instruments. And as you can see in blue, private equity, venture capital, impact investors are the main source of those innovative financing instruments. Development funders, not yet. So, an obvious modest suggestion from here is that if we can reorient some of the 60 billion going today for agricultural innovation in general, if we can reorient that for sustainable agriculture intensification with social and environmental aims, 
with the money that we have today, we could be close to adding a few more dollars to get to the target. If we could reorient some of the five to seven billion dollars that developmental funders like the ones uh, uh, in this panel today are investing uh, in, in the global south, perhaps we can raise this half a billion uh, on innovative financing to a bit more, and, and we will be in a much better shape. Uh, in my next slide. So just to finish, uh, just three points uh, to, to promote more questions and, uh, and discussion. There is very little innovation investment going on relative to the size of the challenges. And it's very little being invested into environmental, social, aims without forgetting productivity, which is the core of, of investment, right? So if you look at productivity, economic, environment, and social, not much. How can we change that balance? That, that will be a great discussion to have. The second one is that the gap uh, does not seem to be huge. It's not, a, it's not such a big gap. Perhaps the estimate can be refined and the gap grows. But today, we, we think that there are enough enough uh, decision-making tools for public and private investors are going to be critical to ensure this effectiveness. How, can we develop these agreed principles and metrics to guide this future investment? Perhaps it would be a nice discussion. And finally, the new financing tools. Uh, they, they come as a high cost. Uh, we are not going to deal with if there is no investment from the public sector to lubricate and to create this platform for new investment uh, from, from other sectors. So I, 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 I leave you there with my five minutes and uh, there is a website. This is a CGR led uh, and promoted commission and we are ending in five months. So I hope you stay tuned and we can share as much results and we can get in the next few weeks and months. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you so much, Ruben. It was indeed thought provoking. Some of the some of the trends that you laid out and some of the needs that we have going forward. Um, we've heard up to now from a set of, a series of, uh, of illuminaries uh, on the priority shifts, but I want to now turn to the audience, to all of you, to tell us what you think. And with that, let me pass it to Julia Turner from uh, FOLU Coalition to take us through the next segment. Over to you, Julia. Thank you, Gita. Um, and hi all, I'm Julia. I work on the finance lever with Gita as part of the Blended Finance Task Force, uh, which works in partnership with FOLU Coalition um, as the Secretariat of the Lever. Um, as Gita said, Martin has laid out the priority shifts in financial systems that the Lever is using as a framing for our work, and Pinya and Ruben have shared insights from the field. Um, so now we'd love to hear from you to both those in Zoom and those following the session on Facebook live stream, please use your phone or laptop to go to www.menti.com or scan the QR code that's currently showing on the screen, which will then bring you to the appropriate page um, and type in 27636867. Um, and then we can do a live quick survey to get, um, get your thoughts and uh, suggestions uh, on what we've heard so far. Um, this will be a brief uh, interlude before we go uh, to the next speakers. Um, so I'll give us a bit of time to uh, have some people join the mentee. Um, and then we'll uh, start the questionnaire. Great, it looks like we've got uh, three people. So I will share my screen and we can see the live results. So the first question is, what do you see as the key shifts in financial systems to support sustainable outcomes? Rank your top three to five. So you'll have seen the financial imperatives that Martin uh, laid out and uh, we're seeing what people see as the most important among these. I mean, obviously for systemic change, we require all of them, but interesting to see that improving access to finance is coming out on top. We've so far had 23, 24 uh, inputs. 
paying for nature and repurposing public support. Um, I'll let a few more come in and we'll save these results. Interesting, so yeah, it looks like uh, we've now had 40 contributions. It looks like indeed improving access to finance for key food systems actors, repurposing public support and fiscal incentives and finding ways to pay for nature and ecosystem services are, are recognized as, as being the most important shifts. Um, and interesting that, you know, paying for nature is, is linked to integrating climate risk. So there's a, there's a degree of connection there. Great, I will, uh, I will move on to the next one now, um, but it's great to get that snapshot. So you should now see that the um, page, the question has uh, been refreshed on your phones or on your laptops. This is a moment to share any interesting, innovative, effective financial solutions that you are aware of. Um, if you type the name onto the screen or a brief description, it will begin to show on the screen and we can crowdsource ideas. Um, and then uh, we will um, both get a quick snapshot, but also we'll save this for our future work in terms of what could be profiled uh, through the Food Systems Summit. So these are funds, platforms, products, great, patients, patient capital, blended finance, Agri3 Fund is a great one that we've uh, got on our radars. Excellent. So loads of ideas here de-risking blending public and private that's coming through a little bit incubation um and microcredit uh de-risking coming through quite quite a bit indeed um and uh, and indeed credit accessibility which is not surprising given the emphasis on improving access to finance partnerships as key which is obviously a, a central focus of the um food system summit Lots of uh, microcredit, microfinance and incubation coming through, but also carbon offset markets, paying for, paying for nature, accounting for the costs of the food systems. Farm Fit Fund is, a, is another one familiar. And of course, the Food Securities Fund by Clare Mondial. Brilliant. Thank you all so much for contributing these. Um, you know, there's, there's a never ending amount that we could include. Um, but uh, we will pause there, we'll capture these and, and make sure to factor them into our work and, our, and, and the, the promotion that we deliver um, and do fire any additional ideas uh, in the chat. I will um, pause there, back to you, Gita. Thank you, Julia. This is really exciting uh, and great ideas and something for us to think about. Um, with that, <clears throat> let me turn to the next uh, segment of our, of our uh, forum. We heard these broad shifts and global movements that are needed, but all the action has to happen at the country level. And the countries are really going to be the drivers in terms of how they see fit for this transformation to happen. So it is my honor and pleasure to introduce David Navarro, who is an institution by himself but is also leading on the uh, country dialogues for the UN Food Summit, and is also the special envoy for COVID-19 for WHO. David, what a pleasure to have you. Over to you. Hey, thank you very much indeed, Geeta. And, and yes, you know, we're doing quite a lot of these Zoom and uh, similar meetings these days, but this is an important one, it really is. You know, we are preparing now for the first ever United Nations Food Systems Summit. We're actually talking about food as a systems issue. And there is a lot of emphasis right now on shifting systems so that they perform better for people and for planet. And there's a lot of evidence about what shifts are necessary. And so, yes, here we are really focusing on the role of finance in encouraging and then maintaining systems shift so that food is good for people, good for the planet and good for prosperity. Let me just share with you just a little bit of what's happening around the world as countries prepare 
for this summit. The special envoy who's responsible for has been asked to organize multi-country food systems summit dialogues, multi-stakeholder dialogues, carefully structured and well facilitated that enable people everywhere to explore what are the major challenges that need to be resolved for food systems to get to where they need to be by 2030. And countries are invited to use the Sustainable Development Agenda with its 17 goals to help set the standard for where a food system should be by 2030. And then to explore what changes need to take place now in order to move in that direction that is so urgently needed. Well, we didn't know how many countries would be interested to initiate dialogues that would help to chart a pathway to the future of their food systems. Would it be 40 or 50 or 60? We just hadn't a clue. We didn't have a lot of money to support this process. We had some technical advice available, but basically we were asking nations just to take this task on as part of their preparation for the Food Systems Summit. As of yesterday, 140 countries have initiated Food Systems Summit dialogues. About 80 of these countries have already gone through several stages of dialogues in their countries with an immense involvement of multiple stakeholders, despite the challenges of COVID-19. The countries, including those who are in extreme difficult situations, they've got conflict or they've been affected by climate change, or most importantly, they have got massive COVID outbreaks, but they're doing it. And some of the countries in the toughest situations are doing the most extraordinary improvisation to hear what needs to change. As I look at the results of these dialogues, I see that the majority of countries that are working on the future of their food systems want to make a major, complete, unified transformation in food systems performance. They don't want to do little bits, just adding a bit here or there. No, they want food systems that are good for nutrition, food systems that are good for the planet, food systems that do reduce rural poverty, food systems that do have a better situation for women who work within them and who are not properly paid, and food systems that are attractive to young people. And this means paying attention to the levers that make change possible. And finance is right at the center of it. So the majority of countries doing the food systems dialogues want to change the way in which their food systems are governed, their food systems are financed, their food systems are staffed, their food systems are organized and managed and judged and monitored. They want complete change because they know that time has come. They know that current food systems, unfortunately, do not incentivize healthy, nutritious, affordable food in the way that they could. So at the Food Systems Summit in September, we're going to, I believe, see the beginnings of massive systems transformation towards more nutritious, environmentally sensitive and resilient food systems everywhere. Resilient in the face of the continuing COVID pandemic, resilient in the face of climate change, resilient in the face of conflict and war. So what you're doing in and around the finance lever is right at front and center of all the necessary efforts for food systems transformation. It's really great that you are doing everything you can to make 
the often impenetrable language and issues in the finance sector accessible to people who do wish to make sustainable and equitable and resilient food systems their central objective. So thank you. Look forward very much to how this process actually advances. And just my view is that the real work will come after the summit. We've just started to lay the table, but the arrival of the food and the meal that we're going to eat will take us through into this coming decade. And that's when the finance lever will come into its own. Thank you again. David, thank you for your leadership. And thank you so much for bringing in the message that countries do want this big transformation and not the silos that we've been operating in in the past. So thank you. With that, let me now turn to our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Yaya Olani Ran, uh, uh, permanent representative of Nigeria to the Rome-based food agencies of the United Nations. Um, Nigeria is the largest economy in Africa. And also this morning, it would be remiss of me not to say that we had a fantastic session that Dr. Yaya moderated on food loss and waste. Over to you, uh, Ambassador. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you just went mute again. Gita, thank you very much for letting me come after David. David always does a heavy lifting and he has done it again. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to express some views about the financial imperatives and how we want to see uh, resources being used for the transformation of food systems. There's a proverb in my language which says, however best you may plan, however desirous you may be, in what you want to do. If money is not there, you're probably not going to go very far. But the beauty of what I've heard this afternoon is that it's not just a question of money being there. And like the president of um, African Development Bank said recently, it said that the question of poverty is more than just money. And David has given us the list of what total transformation of food system can do. If we dovetail that into having financial imperatives to lead us to all the benefits ranging from human health to environmental health to sustainability of our lives and everything we live for, then we're on the right path. I do know that the small holders, the SMEs in Nigeria, for instance, are striving very hard and trying their very best to get resources to run their businesses. It's common, it's traditional, that the banks are not always forthcoming. The interest rates are rather too high for, for agriculture or even value chain issues. So people turn to their family members to get loans, that have no interest rates and friends and so on. But that is still part of the silo we are now saying is outdated. How can we have the 
public sector, the private sector, working in a positive way to make these millions of hands that are ready to work get the financial resources. It is a major headache, but it's not insoluble from what I can see. The political awareness is now higher than ever before. What needs to change based on this morning conversation we had on food loss and food waste is that getting the, 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 the point where intervention is most needed and activated to reduce losses gives prosperity to the farmer, to the processor, and ultimately to the consumers. African Development Bank, for instance, has made available about $500 million for the digitalization of Nigeria. In the area of infrastructure, that will be helpful. The bank is also making, has made available about 288 million dollars to support the federal government efforts in response to COVID. Putting this together and many more is excellent. But I do believe that the government also has a responsibility whereby they will fund the necessary infrastructure, providing the level playing ground that is needed. Because some of the resources that the private sector is now using to get this infrastructure into their own program could easily be given out to more people that will incentivize success and make things better for everyone. I, I believe that improving access to finance as the survey has shown is number one. I do know that to improve reporting and transparency is also key because that will actually factor in the issue of corruption as well as risks that needs to be mitigated. Uh, to pay for nature, it may be a, low, a tall order for now, but I think it's all part of the ultimate. So if government on her part could have policies that will ensure enabling environment, incentivize all the, all the smallholders as well as the SMEs, not neglecting the, the big farms that will need uh, other things, but also to improve the commodity groups, cooperative groups, so that they may have a voice and negotiate better. The less of wastages, the less of food loss, food waste, the better our environment in the sum total. But the financing of all this is critical. And that has to be done with all the necessary efforts and commitment to it. Thank you, Gita. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for laying out first the optimism, but also the complex nature of development and really bringing the non-traditional actors, the private sector uh, um, together to really solve this. So thank you so much for being with us today. With that, I'd like to turn to Hans uh, Hovagen, who is the independent chair of FAO Council. Hans is a champion, champion of forests, champion of food loss and waste, champion of food systems transformation. 
Hans, a very warm welcome. We are delighted to have you here. Over to you. Thank you very much, Gita. And it is an honor and a pleasure and a delight for me to be uh, with you. Uh, and besides my uh, new role as independent chair of the uh, FAO Council, I'm of course also the co-chair of the Champions 12.3 related to food losses. And we all know that our world is changing quickly around us. Innovations spring up like seedlings in spring, but we also see that this expansion has a severe consequences. When you have seen the state of food insecurity and nutrition, we are con confronted with grim and severe vigors. More than 750 million people live in hunger. Three billion people do not have access to safe, affordable and nutritious food. 1.6 billion suffer from nutrition-related diseases. The dots are not connected anymore. And we know that governments are already off track on global goals related to hunger, malnutrition, environmental stress, and livelihoods. And of course, they became even more off track because of the COVID-19 crisis and rising food prices. And we know that financing, and therefore this seminar is so important financing has to be part of the solution and especially we have to focus on investments because what we do need is real innovations in the financial structure it's not as we traditionally do trying to start it up with a global fund and hope that the financing will come especially from governments no we need to have a much more focused financial structure focusing on the national level focusing on investments of the private sector as well. I think that's important to, to realize. And the sustainable long-term productivity growth is critical. Food losses and waste is causing one third of our food being lost. And the current food system has with that implications, not only for the food production, but also for the environment, for water management and other issues. And food loss and waste carries a strong environmental burden, consuming 25% of fresh water, using arable land the size of China, and emitting 8% of global emissions. So there's also a very strong link to climate change. And we also know that all countries contribute to food loss and waste, but in different ways and different degrees. So we have to focus on the national level. And we have to support not only the governments, but especially the investments of the private sector. And when you look to financing, globally, food loss and waste is a trillion dollar problem with massive opportunities for investors and the private sector. But we have to grab them. And there is a need for a dedicated global investment mechanism, certainly in the food losses. Food losses. Estimates suggest that global food losses reduction by 25% would require investments of around $350 billion of 10 years. That are huge figures but I do think we can make it possible. Certainly, if you don't look only to the traditional way of financing, but that we involve other partners, and especially I think to look to the, our parts in the private sector, because we have to ask them the question, what do you need to invest at country level? Would it be Nigeria? Would it be Ghana? Would it be Vietnam? What do you need to invest so that we overcome these problems? And that's why the World Bank FEO and the Netherlands, with others of the, uh, uh, with Olam, with other companies, are working on a global food loss financing facility to be established, hopefully, uh, at the World Food System Summit. Because that facility could offer a deal making platform for actors across the value chain and provide a suite financing instruments that can be blended with existing and new investments. And we certainly certainly need, of course, new investments. And a stronger enabling investment environment and risk mitigation can help to reduce invest investors' risks, can build relationships in countries and enable additional domestic and foreign capital to flow. And of course, it is a combined effort, not only of the private sector, because also, but also with the, with, with the governments. Because for example, governments, if you look to food losses, have to invest in infrastructure. So if you have, for example, storage facilities built, that there are roads where we, they can access those facilities and can access markets. And the idea would be that the business, mo the business model of the facility will accommodate both 
large scale and high impact, but also smaller scale investment to three, two financing windows. One, of course, is the public sector focusing on, I would say, infrastructure, for example, but also education, but also when you, it will be a private sector window where you can see how we can find mechanism to overcome the first risk for private sector, to see how we can make insurance schemes uh, available. And it will be built up, of course, starting at the country scale, country scale and starting at some levels. And the governance, of course, will be made fit for purpose, but it's especially to focus how can we find the instruments, how can we find the investors, how can we help the private sector to invest for that we need a global facility to make sure that we will have new and innovative financing to overcome, for example, our huge problem of food losses. It will help our food systems, but it will also help nutrition. And certainly it will also help, for example, climate change. Therefore, it's also, I would say, a mechanism which should be taken up by the COP climate change. It should also be taken up by the COP of biodiversity because it can also support to over the problems with the loss of biodiversity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hans. Um, what I haven't mentioned is that the, all of this brilliant thinking is that you all are, are now uh, our, our advisors in getting our food finance architecture lock, stock and barrel right. So thank you so much for that. With that, we've heard the country, we started with, with listening to the overall direction of travel that food finance needs to take in order to deliver food systems transformation. We heard from the, the country perspective, and now I'd like to turn to the action, track, um, action tracks, and we have all five here today, to really understand how the, fo the food finance architecture can actually help the action tracks deliver on the outcomes um, and, and objectives that they have set out for themselves. So with that, let me turn to action track one, Andrew Mood, Principal Economist at the International Livestock Research Institute based out of Nairobi. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, thank you very much, uh, Gita. Uh, I think probably uh, just, uh, I'm actually uh, currently working at the African Development Bank where I lead our program on uh, agri-SME financing. Um, under Action Track 1, which I'm very pri pri privileged to represent um, here uh, in this truly seminal conversation. Action Track 1 is chaired by Lawrence Haddad, the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. And really it has its mandate to ensure safe, uh, ensure access to safe and nutritious foods, basically to accelerate towards zero hunger and end all forms of malnutrition. And this requires uh, increased availability of nutritious foods, making food more affordable and requiring uh, inequalities, reducing inequalities uh, to access to food. Uh, slide, please. So as in all action tracks, uh, one of our key mandates was to search for game-changing solutions that would trigger rapid and transformational progress toward our action track objectives. And in the spirit of the People's Summit, ever since November, there's really been an exhaustive effort to cast the net out wide in such of a solution across numerous forums, summits, dialogues, workshops, uh, with a broad range of constituents. And in the process thereafter of review and meaning, this led finally to some of the following set of solution clusters that represent the vetted best bet ideas or action areas to drive the change uh, that we seek. So these solutions are sitting across three of the action areas in action track one. So promote food security and ending hunger, improve access to nutritious foods and making foods uh, safe. And of course the, 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 <clears throat> the clusters had uh, um, are, are across had had contributions from from several different um, action tracks, um, some of the other action tracks. Now, critical to finance is the zero hunger fund, which is largely a mechanism to draw commitments from private sector players, pledging say zero point twenty twenty of their corporate profits. I think this would be about ten billion annually, really to raise resources for a cross action track hunger fund to be deployed towards actions focused on achieving the goal of ending hunger. So this could be a broad range um, from 
uh, funding research and development innovations in the, in the impact space, such as Ruben talked about earlier, of course, entrepreneurship, and also funding the enablers that are critical to establishing the institutions and incentives required to power this transformation. Uh, so continuing on the role of the private sector, the private sector must play in action track one, there was also a regular emphasis on the role of small and medium enterprises. And this converged into a specific solution cluster, uh, the agri-food SME finance and innovation cluster. Uh, SMEs also featured prominently across several action tracks and within this cluster, several solutions from action track four are also integrated. Next slide, please. Now, I think it's worth emphasizing just quickly here, the critical centrality of SMEs in this space. I mean, they're they are really fundamental component to the food systems. And as SMEs go, so will food systems go. That's where the rubber hits the road and where the potential of greatest impacts are with regards to objectives to ensure production, distribution, accessibility of healthy and nutritious foods. They're also the main provider of jobs and livelihoods in the food system. So where the greatest changes for gender and youth inclusion and equity can be found. Um, and also any shock to the food system is amplified through the SME ecosystem. So that is where the returns to building resilient and sustainable food systems will be greatest. Next slide, please. So with regards uh, the collective areas of focus, I mean, these are components that we have found not just in the SME cluster or the zero hunger pledge, but generally in other financial solutions we have been coming about, uh, we see some common characteristics. And interestingly, I saw earlier in the, uh, in the Menti pledge, you saw a lot of these words coming. So in the first, we look at concessional capital, which is really a de-risking capital facility. We heard a lot about de-risking. We saw blended facility coming, um, um, a, a blended finance coming in large in the Menti pool. So really providing highly restoral and funding, with large grant components that really is capital willing to underwrite the transformation, willing to integrate the true cost of food. Um, uh, second, impact orientation. And I think we saw this also, the importance of standards coming out quite slow, um, strongly. We had ESG. So if we're going to be seeking concessionary resources to underwrite impact, then we have to make, we must clearly be able to measure and to signal credibly um, impact that the resources are going to the right place. So we need standardized, we need broadly endorsed metrics, and we need tools to integrate them effectively training people around them and efficiency. And I saw a question around you know, where blockchain can play. I think blockchain and smart contracts can play probably a very big role here. And then of course we have to uh, have sufficient pipeline. And we talked about incubation, uh, another word that came out strongly. And so you, you need to be able to pay for the, or, or develop that sufficient density of impact aligned transformational projects. Um, early opinion was to, uh, of Slow was talking about the need, not just for finance, but to build networks and to build partnerships and make market linkages. This is where that kind of, um, uh, where finance will be needed to build this kind of capacity, these kind of linkages. Next slide. Exactly. And so finally, coming back to some of the financial imperatives Martins was highlighting earlier, I mean, many of these seem very much aligned to some of the solutions that we're seeing coming out from our process. And so, for example, just quickly, when you see, you know, when you're trying to make a case for a significant amount of resources that are concessionary and are seeking transformational returns, then you require a willingness to, to pay or to internalize the cost of true cost of food, for example, to pay for resilience or pay for nature, pay for resilience, or for example, must, might mean to pay the cost of developing and deploying precise climate risk insurance products or for de-risking for de -risking the food system, or paying sub subsidies for premiums, or supporting enterprises that are innovating around the space. And if you're talking about repurposing public spending, um, so for example, where nutrition is a priority and healthy people are public good, then public spending must underwrite or could underwrite nutrition-owned businesses. Um, and of course, blended finance sits right in this space. And of course, improving access to finance. That really is the main goal that defines a broad swath of the objectives of these solutions. So addressing the barriers to SMEs and sustainable projects. And finally here, accountability is highlighted. That is really our impacts, our impact components. So being able to report with transparency and with that innovation in the cost of monitoring that you're able to deliver um, impact. 
So really, I think that there's a lot of alignment um, and more will continue to be done as we move toward the summit and beyond. Uh, but this does represent a critical role to get the finance right for healthy people and healthy climate. Thank you. Andrew, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. And once again, apologies for getting your institution wrong. I think nothing is more irritating than getting one's name or institution wrong, and I got one of it wrong. So, but fantastic, fantastic presentation. Thanks again for being with us. I'd like to turn to Martin Lemoyne now, who is the finance lead for Action Track 2 that focuses on shift to sustainable consumption patterns. Martin, over to you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much, Gita, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Martin Lemoine. I'm the head of Agribusiness Financing at the Asian Development Bank and the finance lead for the Action Track 2. Action Track 2 promotes a shift to sustainable consumption patterns. How will this shift happen? And what is the role of finance? To help change consumer behaviors, we can actually use traditional marketing tools, namely the four P's of the marketing mix, product, price, place, and promotion. First, we need to make the product available. Public and private finance should be mobilized to promote the increased availability of fruits and vegetables, whole grain staples, and alternative proteins. It should become as attractive to farmers and merchants to grow and sell these products as it is for corn or meat today. At the same time, let's not lose the product on the way. One third of the food is lost or wasted, as we've mentioned. It's a one trillion cost every day. And it makes sense to invest one trillion in the next decade to recover some of these losses. Public and private finance have a central role to play again. And the food is never waste coalition has been formed to mobilize funds in order to cut food waste by 50% and reduce food loss by 2030. Second element of the marketing mix is the price. Here we need to use fiscal policy to change behaviors. First, by taxing unhealthy food and drinks. A UK tax on sweet drinks, for example, has immediately reduced consumption and also caused manufacturers to reduce sugar levels in their products. Another fiscal tool would be to tax products with high carbon footprint via the VAT, for example. This could help generate carbon credits that could be used to promote low carbon footprint agriculture, particularly in low income country. Another example of fiscal policy would be to subsidize healthy food. WHO has shown that subsidies to reduce prices of fruit and vegetable by 10 to 30 percent is sufficient to effectively increase consumption. Finally, another way to make healthy food more affordable would be through conditional cash transfers and vouchers, through which mechanism the vendor of healthy food would also be rewarded. For lower income countries with limited fiscal space, the subsidies and the cash transfer or voucher programs would need to be financed by development assistance. The third element of the marketing mix is place. That is the place where the food is sold or consumed. This place can have a huge influence on consumer choices. Modern retailers, but also farmers markets or informal vendors in developing uh, countries have an important role to play to guide consumer choices. Schools are a critical place where good food can be delivered and good habits can be learned. The School Meals Coalition has been formed and advocates for 4.7 billion to be spent annually, 3 billion from domestic sources and 1.7 billion from international assistance for lower income countries. Finally, the last P of the marketing mix is promotion. Country-specific approaches are needed to educate, inform, and motivate consumers. All countries should have science-based, food-based dietary guidelines that can be used to educate consumers, for example, at school, 
and to inform them, for example, by including nutritional information on product packaging. To further influence consumers, activists' networks could be empowered. Emotions are as important as facts to influence consumers. Taxes on advertising that promotes unhealthy diets could be used to fund advertising campaigns for healthy diets. As we can see through these four Ps, the, achieve, the achievement of the 82 vision relies heavily on a few financial imperatives, particularly one, repurposing public spending and fiscal incentives, two, scaling up development assistance to countries with no fiscal space, and three, improving reporting and transparency so that consumers can make informed choices. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Martin. I think highlighting the fact that in, in rethinking um, the finance, uh, uh, finance flows is very important and the role of taxation. So thank you so much for being with us. Let me turn to action track three, uh, Ben Wok, who's the finance lead. Uh, and action track three is boost, boost nature positive production. Over to you, Ben. Nice to have you with us. Thank you so much, Gita. Uh, and very nice to be here. And thanks everyone for your, for your interest and contribution also to solving the issue of uh, finance for food. Uh, in the slide here, you can see the clusters of solutions that have been uh, brought forward by Action Track 3, uh, the Action Track for Nature Positive Production. And uh, under the headers of protect, manage, and restore, you can see the various uh, clusters of solutions that are here. Some of them have relations between themselves, of course. Um, for instance, um, the soil hub uh, uh, on your lower right hand uh, with uh, agroecology and regenerative agriculture, for instance. Actually, there's also uh, certainly a relationship to agrobiodiversity if you realize that more carbon, carbon in the soil is typically also good for soil health and also um, uh, biodiversity uh, supported by, by uh, better soil health. So um, these are the clusters of solutions. We're analyzing each of these um, in terms of both their finance requirements or challenges um, and also funding requirements. So what's needed to finance the change. Um, a nice finding and um, to put in also a bit of private sector finance uh, lens here, a nice finding is that many of the transitions that are foreseen here uh, actually have a strong economic business case uh, after the transition. So in the situation of more sustainable production, nature positive production. Um, if I look at blue and aquatic foods, uh, we know that, that um, let's say seafood or fish is, um, uh, is definitely one of the solutions for, for protein in the future um, and can typically, of course, be produced uh, on a cleaner, but also um, an economically viable basis. Uh, so that transition in itself uh, holds kind of the promise of, of, um, of being financed based on a, on a, a workable business case. The same is true for uh, the soil uh, hub and regenerative agriculture. Um, and let me go into that uh, for a second in some more detail just to indicate how we work on these issues. Um, obviously, better soil health uh, for, for agricultural production lands um, allows for better uh, productivity of the land. Uh, that's totally clear. And, and therefore, better soil health in itself already has a positive business case for farmers um, in, in terms of uh, productivity. But if we can combine it, as was just also mentioned, with uh, payment for, for nature services and especially for carbon sequestration through carbon credits, then we generate, of course, an external cash flow into the system 
um, that further helps also improve the economic viability and therefore the bankability or investability or financeability in general. So, um, so that is the way we look at these. You know, we're, we're combining the sustainability view and the food systems view with an economic analysis. That's basically what we're doing here. If you look back at our financial imperatives, you will see that all of the 10 financial imperatives are basically uh, almost universally and equally important for, for this action track. Um, I hope that I've kind of teased you a bit on, on the whole idea of carbon credits, regenerative agriculture and soil and the ecosystem restoration hub. Uh, restoration of degraded lands is another, of course, that holds a very good uh, economic opportunity. Food loss reduction does. Uh, so we're not, not necessarily short. Some, some of these uh, clusters of solutions ask more for public uh, financing and, and um, for many of them, uh, repurposing subsidies is also very important. We can reduce food loss, but if we don't repurpose or right size subsidies and uh, public support, uh, financial support uh, policies, then then, um, then we're, we're having a suboptimal approach there. So um, this is a, a lot of work. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you um, listening in are also involved in uh, one or more of these aspects. Um, I want to point out that, um, uh, of course, yesterday the European Commission published its plans for um, uh, for climate action uh, in in the European Union. Um, important uh, issues there were also uh, carbon sequestration, carbon credits. Um, that market is actually a wild and untamed market at the moment where you uh, pay for um, uh, carbon credits, um, a ton of, of CO2 equivalent uh, sequestration, anything between $50 cents to hundreds of dollars. Um, multilaterals, uh, including World Bank, are making an effort to stabilize that price on a minimum of 30 or $40. Uh, there are calculations that point more uh, in the direction of $70 per ton. But it is important, of course, uh, that we stabilize this market and that we also overlay uh, compliance markets where, for instance, the EU proposal, the European Commission proposal uh, focuses on um, and, and voluntary markets because there's a huge potential um, from other industries, uh, energy, uh, automotive, uh, airline industries, etc., uh, for these kind of products uh, that can also benefit our farmers. So uh, taking the view, and I'll stop there, taking the view that the farmer is not just a food producer, but also a provider of, of nature-based services uh, is probably key here. Thank you so much, and back to you, Gita. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, spot on on all, all your points and particularly getting the carbon markets and carbon prices right to be the first stepping block in terms of the big transformation. So thank you so much for reminding us and a great presentation. With that, let me pass, uh, let me now um, invite uh, Bettina Prato, uh, who is the finance lead for Action Track 4, Advanced Equitable Livelihoods. Bettina, what a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Gita. So yes, my name is Bettina Prato. I am the senior coordinator of a network that is called the Smallholder and Agri-SME Finance and Investment Network, SAPIN. But I will be speaking on behalf of Action Track 4 today. Action Track 4 is chaired by Michelle Nunn, the CEO of CARE. Um, in general, this particular action track is focused, I think, most closely on the human and social aspects of the agenda of food system transformation. And it's really used the notions of livelihoods and equity as entry points to look at how current patterns of distribution of power, uh, capabilities, respect or lack of respect for human rights, 
uh, but also policies, institutions, and relationships among different food system actors are holding back food systems from delivering on the SDGs and really leaving many people, uh, but also their aspirations and their dignity behind. So issues of rights, uh, including human rights, generally speaking, but also specific rights, for example, land rights or indigenous people's rights, uh, as well as inclusion, gender equality, decent employment, inclusive governance have been really front and center in the conversations within uh, this action track. And they're really the, the threads that are connecting the various solutions that have emerged from it, including uh, as concerns finance. There are three action areas in this particular track that have to do with rebalancing agency in food systems, eliminating worker exploitation and promoting decent work and localizing food systems. And I'm quite happy to be leading a solution cluster under localizing food systems that is specifically about inclusive finance. So how uh, relevant has finance been to the work of this uh, action track? It's featured in three main ways. Uh, around people's incomes and wages, around inclusive access to finance that I saw came up uh, uh, on top of the uh, issues valued by participants in this uh, forum through the Mentis survey, and particularly access to finance for women, for youth, for SMEs, uh, for indigenous people's communities. And then a third as uh, equitable and efficient public spending, uh, spending in particular areas like social protection, but also more generally um, spending in public goods and um, looking at inclusive uh, uh, decision making around budgeting and spending, for example, through territorial approaches to um, food system investments. Now, in terms of the solution proposals that have emerged, they have been uh, quite varied in nature. Uh, there have been some proposals for initiatives, for example, for large scale use of digital technologies to really transform. Um, the parameters of access to finance uh, in the rural space for particular groups of people. There have also been uh, proposals of uh, raising the bar in terms of the commitments, the ambitions of financial institutions, as well as other actors, you know, governments, private sector, for gender transformative finance, um, which has been a really important theme in, in the action track. A coalition uh, to ensure living wages and incomes for all uh, in food systems by 2030. And also some uh, suggestions about um, establishing new financial vehicles, for example, uh, funds or facilities, targeting agricultural properties or um, young people within indigenous people's communities and so forth. Finally, some proposals have been about um, initiatives like platforms or alliances to strengthen the development finance architecture around food systems with an inclusive lens, for example, uh, around uh, the public development bank community. The imperatives that uh, were shared with us by Martin, I think resonate broadly speaking with a conversation in action track four, particularly as concerns the headings uh, related to improving incomes, optimizing and scaling development flows and, and improved access to finance. There is an additional imperative, maybe a cross-cutting imperative, if you will, um, that has to do with how uh, we can ensure that people, their rights, their dignity, are really the central concern um, in, in all of this, in realizing, implementing all of these financial imperatives, rather than being seen as maybe a secondary positive externality for some of these. And if you allow me to wear for just a second my hat also as vice chair of the Champions Network for Women and Gender, I think there's also room in these imperatives to recognize uh, the need to use finance in gender transformative ways across the board through the different levers or, or entry points that you've identified. Also uh, important from the perspective of action track four is, is to really connect the imperatives that are currently under scaling investment and improving access to finance. So that as we mobilize, you know, we increase scale and efficiency in the mobilization of different sources of finance. This is really designed to reach the hands of all operators in food systems, starting from those that are currently underserved or left behind by the financial ecosystem around food and agriculture. And I mentioned some of these. 
So, and for this, I want to refer to what Andrew said, which is the importance of not just increasing or improving supply, but also really strengthening the capacity of these actors to develop bankable enterprises, bankable projects, to, to really be able to access and use finance productively. One final, uh, very final point from the perspective of Action Track 4 is that on the imperative related to reducing unsustainable investment, um, we would recommend maybe strengthening the ambition of this particular imperative and aiming for alignment of all investments to existing guidelines and principles for responsible investment, starting from those issued under the uh, Committee on Workforce Security, the CFS, which aim to bring together environmental sustainability, inclusion, and once again, respect for human rights under the same uh, set of principles. That's all from my side. Thank you, Gita. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Bettina. And thanks again for reminding us that the finance system needs to work for the smallholders. It needs to work for, for women and it needs to work for smaller groups that get overlooked. So thank you for that great, great presentation. And with that, let me pass, uh, let me invite um, Action Track 5, Jose Luis Vivero, who is um, uh, going to talk, who is going to talk about uh, Building Resilience to Vulnerability, Shocks and Stress, which is the Action Track 5 uh, heading. Over to you, Jose. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gita. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Yes, perfect. So, well, um, I'm Jose Luis Vivero, um, um, policy officer in the World Food Program that uh, as part of our anchoring role supporting Action Track 5 has been designated by, by the two co-chairs of Action Track 5, uh, Sandrine Dixon and Salim Hook, uh, to present uh, today because I think that also we, uh, as part of the core team um, I'm, I'm deeply involved in, in, in all the issues. Uh, particularly, we are, I mean, our, as you have already mentioned, uh, our track uh, emphasizes on uh, building resilience and uh, particularly transformative uh, resilience, uh, transformative food systems that uh, are pretty much based on, on local production for local consumption. That is one of the protocol issues that we are, uh, that is, is meant to be launched uh, during the pre-summit. And also we want to emphasize that some of the issues that have already been mentioned by my colleagues on the different tracks, they also resonate with, with Action Track 5. Because as you may understand, there are several issues that are by nature, cross-cutting issues that have already been mentioned by, by Andrew or by, by Bettina, such as human rights or local production, digitalization, or indigenous people's food systems. So uh, please, the, the next one. Um, what we have, uh, um, contrary to what has been presented before, in our track, although we already achieve uh, solution clusters, uh, as my colleagues have already presented for all the tracks, uh, we were also instructed by, by the Food Systems Summit Secretariat that we need to re converge even more and then to, let's say, consolidate the, the clusters in broader packages that are defined as proto coalitions according to the, the summit terminology. And those are the four proto coalitions that you can see in front of you. Uh, the, 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 yellow, the, the green labels are the action areas that we all have in the tracks, but also within every action area, we have uh, four. Uh, proto coalitions in total. Uh, two proto coalitions in, uh, under uh, food system resilience, one related to human HTP nexus and conflict and hunger, one on resilient food supply chains, local production for local consumption. Uh, the, the third one on, on food is a public good, human right and commons, uh, universal food access as, as a policy proposal and indigenous people's food systems as game changers in themselves as, as uh, key components. And then a fourth uh, proto coalition around climate resilient development pathways, uh, where several elements, uh, several thematic areas are included. Uh, as you can see, I mean, in red, I've already included a few game changing individual solutions that we received, okay, because that's important to note. We are not inventing new things. What we were doing since the beginning, since basically since January, is we have been collecting, in our case, more than 250. Uh, individual solutions submitted by different stakeholders, member states included, and we have already vetted them and, and finally uh, prioritized them. So out of 106 uh, individual solutions, we have clustered them initially in action areas, later on in solution clusters, and finally 
uh, the individual solutions are clustered in those four big protocol issues. You can see those uh, ideas related to financial mechanisms, uh, related to uh, investment in conflict areas, micro borrowing mechanisms, finance for food, that is uh, one uh, solution submitted by the UNCDF, uh, blended financial mechanisms uh, based targeting women and, and youth, and, and it's also related to small and uh, medium SMEs, small and medium enterprises that has been referred before. Then also on the right side, uh, you can see that uh, issue resilience, uh, we explain later on, index-based life, livestock insurance, uh, several innovative mechanisms that they, they aim at uh, reducing risk uh, for smallholder producers. So that's one, and, and pastoralists. That's, those are, let's say, weak, uh, weak elements in the financing chain, financial chain, sorry. Then climate risk profiling uh, related, uh, and finally, food system, and the Food Systems Stability Board that um, I know that Gita knows perfectly because we have been, it has been, uh, basically proposed by, by the World Bank, the World Research Institute, and follow. So uh, those are just a few of the individual solutions related to finance that we have included, but I would like to highlight well, one point. You can see that there are some protocol issues that they are well served because of the ongoing and new financial mechanisms are already targeting those uh, thematic issues, climate resilient development pathways, HDP nexus, and uh, resilient food supply chains. And yet, there are some other transformative elements, especially those related to human rights approaches and indigenous people's food systems, that they're underserved. And that's well, the point for your consideration. Because uh, I was quite, um, let's say, pleased to, to see that uh, my colleague Martin uh, Van Miekom mentioned something that is really one uh, a, a transformative uh, sentence, saying that. Uh, Financial systems sometimes, uh, perhaps more often than, than not, they undermine food systems transformation. And, and that's, a, that's a good statement. And I think that as we can see, I mean, there are some areas that are relevant to transform uh, food systems towards further and more sustainable ones that are so far from the financial point of view, not well served. Uh, the next one, please. Just to give you an example, or actually two examples more concretely, on two elements that are well developed, uh, two existing platforms that have already been included into the protocol issue around climate resilient development pathways. You, you have in front of you issue resilient, the issue resilience global partnership with more than 100 members out of, out of them, at least 15 member states that they have already pledged uh, their support uh, to this idea to minimize uh, climate related risk and uncertainties for smallholder producers. And, and that uh, the, the idea it was already launched in 2017, pretty much associated to the COP uh, series and then U the UNFCCC, but with strong implications for, uh, for the food systems because it really touches uh, the uncertainties and risk uh, that uh, small scale producers and peasants and pastoralists, they suffer with this changing climate. Please, the next one. The next one is also associated to climate because as, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, climate related uh, financial mechanisms are, are, really, are really well developed and fine tuned and in many cases well known with, with resources. Because of course, climate is, a, is not a hot issue, if you may allow me the, the joke, but it's also a, a climate emergency. And the second one is, is risk informed early, early action partnerships. That is also, it's, it's related to early warning and anticipatory action, like a forecast-based forecast -based mechanism. And also the idea is to cover more than uh, 1 billion people with this type of innovative mechanism uh, to secure their production, either livestock or crops uh, on, on, uh, around, let's say, to secure them against uh, climate viruses. The next one, and this is the last one, just to end with, with a, few, a few reflections because I think that the, the list that has been provided on the financial imperatives that has been uh, prepared by, by this finance lever is it's quite good. Actually, I mean, I wanted to emphasize, you know, the, the key points that they really resonate well with our track and our priorities. And at the end, I ended up having everything in red, uh, almost everything in red. So things related to integrate climate risk, yes, uh, uh, repurpose public spending, and, and uh, I would like to make just uh, a personal summary of these, let's say, 
uh, complete list. The first one is that true cost accounting, okay? And I will be very brief for the sake of time. True cost accounting and the current situation that we have on low cost food systems. We cannot afford to have low cost food systems. So I think that food should be valued better or should be valued differently and not, not as a cheap product, cheap labor, cheap nature, cheap food. So I think that we, we, start, we need to start considering that uh, as food is essential for everybody, it should be valued accordingly, okay? The second point is that we need to fund more and better prevention and anticipatory actions rather than just going behind the humanitarian disasters that we all know that of course they, they, they will uh, trigger um, huge funds, but I think that we can save more, it's, it's wiser uh, to, to prevent and it's cheaper to prevent as well. Then the third point is that, we, and it's already mentioned there, we need to really commit to have higher public expenditures on food systems. Because if we learn from the long history, let's say from the last uh, 20th century, we can see that uh, starting from the Marshall Plan to reconstruct Europe, the US or examples like the US or Korea, public expenditure is the mainstay to promote the uh, agricultural growth and to really achieve uh, a strong food system. So it's basically public expenditure. And in that sense, some uh, commitments like the Malabo Declaration to reach 10% uh, of, of uh, gross DP to be invested in agriculture. I think that this type of uh, public uh, engagements, they should be pursued. The fourth point is that, and it's also mentioned there, and, and it's already mentioned in, in by Bettina in Action Track 4, I think that the best option to, to have uh, financial investments is through decent wages, okay? And I think that because decent wages that are associated to uh, food baskets. So to have a minimum wage that uh, that will enable anyone to get access to a decent and, and a sustainable and healthy diet. And finally, the second best option, it could be through universal social protection, that it's already an ongoing initiative and it's also quite linked to the universal food access proposal that is already proposed by, by 84. Uh, the fifth uh, point is the, the era of voluntary codes of conduct for food corporations, I think that it, it may be over because it's already mentioned and I really like it, it's emphasized that we need to shift from voluntary to mandatory codes uh, of conduct. And I think that personally, I fully agree with that. And, and finally, uh, I would like just to, ma to make a word of caution and it's already related to the yellow square that you can see in front of you, is that uh, although there are relevant advantages of having uh, of valuing food adequate sorry food uh, nature adequately and and, and uh, ecosystem services etc you also you you may be aware that that, that issue of um, privatizing nature nature uh, defining nature as nature capital uh, commodifying na natural services it also it brings a lot of controversies. And then there are people and, and institutions and nations and cultures that are pretty much against this commodification of nature. And actually just to end the, the IBES uh, panel, uh, basically one prefers to emphasize nature contribution to people rather than, than ecosystem services. But that's just a word of caution. In any case, I mean, all the, the different imperatives that are presented there they, they, they are pretty good and they resonate well with our track. Thank you very much, Gita. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Jose, thanks. I, uh, Julia, over to you for the Q&A. Thank you, Gita, and thank you to our great speakers. Um, we're now going to have a very brief uh, Q&A. Uh, we've, had, we've had such great interventions. Uh, so I'm afraid we've only got sort of uh, five or 10 minutes for our Q&A. Um, I've, I'll, I'll kick us off with a um, question that was posed uh, in the chat and, um, and, and, and one that was also uh, linked to some of Pinya's comments. So I guess first, Pinya, it would be great to hear what your call to action is um, based on the points that you raised around what's your call to action to increase access to finance for businesses like yours um, uh, and how can we deliver that through the Food Systems Summit? Hi, thank you, Julia. Um, so, I mean, my call to action uh, would be uh, for all uh, institutions who want to uh, help transform the food system 
uh, to really uh, reassess the uh, investment mandates, right? I know that it is, uh, you know, often risky. I know that, you know, these projects are often located in, in you know, high risk countries and so on. Uh, but nothing uh, is going to happen uh, if, if these projects uh, don't get financed. Thank you so much, Pinya. One question that was also raised in the chat was around um, how do we make global capital available to entrepreneurs in least developed countries with underdeveloped capital markets beyond turning to microfinance? Bettina, I don't know if you could share some thoughts on that. Thank you, Julia. Well, this is, uh, this is, this is really one of the tough ones, right? Um, the, I, you know, the, the, uh, the solution or the answer that I often hear to these questions is like, we need more blended finance. The reality is that we have very little of global flows of blended finance, global trans, you know, the, the transaction in blended finance happening in, in the least developed countries. Right? So there is, there is a need to really increase the volume of development finance that is deployed for entrepreneurship support. Um, so my, my answer would be there's no quick fix but we need uh, more, more uh, purposeful utilization of international development finance flows for support to um, entrepreneurship for, for SME development, uh, to support specialized uh, uh, funds that direct their investments in SMEs, and also to de-risk the work of, of, uh, of the banking sector, frankly, even though we know that there is not much finance that goes to small and medium enterprises that comes directly from commercial banks, that is where the capacity to uh, mobilize volumes of finance still lies. I want to um, just link to what Pinya um, said. Um, corporate actors, you know, companies that operate within value chains uh, very often play a really critical role as intermediators of finance for the smaller companies, you know, for the smaller emerging entrepreneurs. That is also an area where I think um, international development finance really needs to look more carefully at what are the opportunities right, to facilitate access to finance for the smaller entrepreneurs through better partnerships or connections with larger uh, actors, including international corporate actors in, in value chain. So that, so that would be my, my long winded answer. I don't know what happened to my video, sorry about that. Thank you, Bettina. That was uh, that was very helpful and not um, not um, not uh, not long winded at all. Um, I'm afraid there's only time for one more question, and then uh, I will hand over to um, Johan Swinnen for uh, closing remarks on the session. Um, I might turn to um, Andrew again to hear uh, when we're thinking about minimizing malnutrition specifically in Africa and developing countries. What steps do you see being taken already and what more is needed to be done to, uh, to target malnutrition? Well, I mean, thanks, thanks for that question. I think what is already being done, I think we're seeing a, a huge shift in the, in, in the recognition of the importance of, 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 of nutrition and also particularly now given the you know, impacts of the COVID foundation. I mean, the centrality or the link between you know, nutrition and, and an immunity system. Uh, you know, to help minimize, um, you know, the impacts of, of catching the pandemic has been highlighted as quite important. And what that has mean, there's been, a, you know, a lot of, of, of increased investment. Uh, look, there's a huge program, the African Leaders for Nutrition Initiative, uh, that we, the African Development Bank is championing along with the AU. Um, is bringing really high level leadership to champion and advocate around nutrition and healthy diets. Um, the AU actually uh, um, is considering or they might have already declared 2022 as the as African year for nutrition. So it just highlights what that's being done, but still quite a bit more work needs to be done. This also allows me to highlight one area that I, I, I might perhaps not have emphasized. One of the important reasons that the, this centrality of metrics also came up through Action Track 1 is when you look at um, you know metrics around nutrition, what do we mean about good nutrition investment? I think ar around the key indicators we're looking in the food system transformation process, um, nutrition metrics are amongst the under, you know, not very well developed, not very well agreed, 
uh, as opposed to let's say for gender where you have you know through the two x challenge financing for, for women very clear metrics very clearly involved and you see that actually begin to shift finance um, so you know I can't say the degree to the relationship but you're seeing a lot of a lot of resources going into supporting you know financing um, um, for, for women the same is true of climate change climate change also perhaps not to the level of gender but climate change also has important um, indicator so really because once you have good metrics you can begin to to craft financial products and assets around this so for example last year the african development bank issued um, a three billion dollar um, covid uh, uh, social social bond and this social bond was linked to particular metrics uh, and more and more you hear about green bonds you hear about resilience bonds these in order to really begin to draw serious capital into these resources you have to have impacts and I think finally, I'll just say more broadly, you know, this also coming out in a lot of the action tracks is the importance of social protection and mandatory. When you look at where most of the, the malnourished are, they're in, in fragile areas, they're in areas where they need to, they require social protection, they require food aid. A lot of the food that's provided is currently not highly nutritious. So a lot of innovation into making sure that at least that most critical constituency Gets, um, uh, gets nutrition and also school mandatory school feeding programs have been shown to be a way to deliver and ensure that the food that they're providing is healthy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin, for uh, for Andrew for both setting out the um, the, the the need for sort of indicators around uh, malnutrition, but also the need to think about the broader context and the intersections of of poverty and malnutrition and and the ways to tackle that. Um, I'm very sorry, but we'll have to pause on questions. We've collated all the ones from the chat and we will be following up with the uh, participants at the, off, off the back of this. So hope to speak with many of you um, afterwards. I will now hand over to uh, Johan Swinner, Swinnen um, to provide the um, closing remarks. Johan Swinnen is Director General of IFPRI and uh, in that capacity uh, is the research lead of the Finance Lever. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Julia, and thank you very much for everybody who has participated in, in the, the meeting here today. It was an extremely rich meeting, I think. It was great to hear all these, uh, the diversity of, of, of views, of contributions, of uh, emphasis on different uh, things that everybody thought was important. It was a very wide range, both of participants, their backgrounds and their connections to the finance system and to the food systems, and uh, on a wide set of themes which have been um, discussed as well. One of the things I, I think was really important, okay, I have now participated in a number of these events, and if you see the progress that has been made, I think in terms of the thinking, but also in the terms of being more precise, more focused, and more actionable in terms of what we can do, what we can uh, make happen uh, at the summit and beyond the summit, I think that's really, really encouraging. I have a draft, I've actually written down a couple of common themes and some uh, personal reflections. I have uh, four minutes left or something. So I'm just gonna go far fast and just try to point these out, uh, hopefully for going forward. First thing, something that many people said, and I think uh, David Nabarro said, and, and Martin Frick in the beginning most uh, empathically, we need big changes. We need massive changes from our, our, of our food system to make this happen. Small changes will not be good enough. Finance is an essential element of that. It's a crucial component. And so the, the being here and having all these discussions and this idea is really fundamental in making these changes possible. A third point is that if you look at the failures of our food system today, these are multiple. So we have failures in terms of diets, in terms of sustainability, in terms of resilience, in terms of inclusion of smallholders, poor gender uh, aspects of that. So the challenge is huge, not just in the size, but also in the different objectives that we want to achieve. The timing is important. Timing because, as Martin Frick said, climate change, is, climate change is here today and it is here under a worst case scenario. But at the same time, we are facing COVID-19 impact still today. And COVID-19 has, I think, many implications for the Food Summit discussion. It has worsened many of the failures that existed already in terms of unemployment going up, incomes going down, food insecurity going up, access to finance uh, more problematic. So that is going to reinforce our, the problems of dealing with it. At the same time, I think there's also positive uh, elements there. I think uh, COVID-19 have brought out a lot of creativity in people, both in the private sector and the public sector, trying to deal with it, for example, in, in food value change. 
But I think it's also changed our minds in the people who are thinking about policy problems and policy solutions and going further to that. And I think that the, the, create, the creativity and the openness of minds that we have to take into the Food Summit in the fall. Uh, I also noted from David Nabarro's intervention that there is a great amount of excitement among at the country level. Um, he mentioned more than 140 countries now involved in these uh, dialogues, often in, in very intense ways. I think also all the contributions we heard today from different people on the panels here today, also from the action tracks in particular, there's a lot of excitement there and a lot of uh, good ideas are coming out. The question is, how much do we need in terms of finance? There's a lot of numbers which have been, uh, which are now around coming out of different uh, reports. We know the following numbers. There's this new estimates on the true cost of food, etc. cetera. Um, but I think, and so these numbers are really, they're large, okay? And so these are big things we have to address. At the same time, I think there's also uh, other signs, if you want, that come out of some of these numbers. For example, Ruben Echevarria presented his, we need $15 billion uh, per year extra, um, CRS 230, which was a research consortium and also work by Eugenio Diaz Bonilla of IFPRI, they come up with numbers which are in the same order of magnitude and they say, this is manageable, this is not unsurmountable, and so we can do it to bring these uh, funds together. How can we do it? What's the instruments? There was a lot of discussion today about instruments. We are clearly having here work in progress. I think I cannot go into detail on this, but I think what's important is that many of the presentations from the action track set came to the conclusion that a lot of the ideas actually fit in the 10 financial imperatives that the finance leader is working on. So I think that's very encouraging. Clearly work in progress. Bettina, for example, mentioned a couple of things that could be improved, could be added maybe, etc. I think also the issue of metrics and accountability came back several times. And I think that's really important. We need good metrics so we can hold people accountable for and steer people in a better direction, giving different incentives. Who has to make these changes? It's clear that um, everybody needs to be involved, okay? We need action at the global level. We need it at the country level, something which was emphasized several times. We need the public sector and we need the private sector and all kinds of other organizations to make contributions to the change. I think in innovation and traditional problems, I just want to make a side point on this. You know, many of the problems we are discussing today, we know already, we have known for many decades. So they are in a way traditional problems, things like basic access to finance of smallholders, infrastructural deficiencies, enabling environments which are not there. And so the issue there is more where we can contribute innovative solutions rather than that the problems in themselves are new. But of course, there are, as I started by saying, several um, new problems as well that we have to address. I think things like e-commerce, contract-based financing, etc. many things have been offered there. Another point on who we have made changes all along the food systems. We need consumers who change their behavior. There's been discussion action track two on the role of taxation on there and subsidies. We need public expenditures which have to be repurposed. Work by IFPRI and the World Bank is coming up with really encouraging work that this can contribute to both better diets and better uh, sustainability outcomes. Private sector, I think Martin made a good, a strong case in terms of enhancing accountability, reducing unsustainable solutions. Several people came back to that. I think also what was interesting from Ben Valk's in, uh, contribution in, in Action Tag 3, looking at how can you create systems which have a good business case, taking them forward in the future, also looking at new instruments like or concept like carbon markets for the agri-food system, the ETS system, uh, which could be expanded, et cetera. All work in progress, I think. Let me end by two uh, points then. One is about the timing, another aspect of timing. Clearly, this is not gonna be resolved in the fall of 2021. We really need to come up with solutions which are not only um, important beyond the summit, but actually have, have, a, have a support system, a political support system or a, a coalition support system to move them beyond and to be implemented. And that brings me, uh, me by my last point on political coalitions. This is something that I know that Agnes Kalibata is really um, thinks it's an, it's an essential element of what we try to do. And I think certainly on the finance side of it as well. So if we come up, with these proposals for solutions, we have to think about uh, private sector, public sector, NGOs, groups, both lo locally and globally, who are willing to support them and to make it happen. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Johan, for a brilliant summary of the discussion. And thank you all so much for participating. Thank you to our speakers, to our audience for posing the questions. As we said, we will um, follow up with a recording of the session and uh, materials and uh, look forward to working with many of you in the months to come. Thank you all. Have a great day.